Wednesday. You know what that means, time for the Southern California Writers Association Hump Day Book Tour. I'm your host, Maddie Margarita, here with our producer, Diana Pardee, on tech. Every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m., the Southern California Writers Association turns our Facebook page over to a new writer to talk about their books. Today, we are pleased to welcome back Dave Putnam. Uh, during Dave's law enforcement career, Deputy Dave Putnam worked primarily in California on teams for patrol, investigations, SWAT, narcotics, street level and majors, violent crimes, criminal intelligence, internal affairs, and the Detective Bureau. I don't think you missed many um, assignments in there, Dave. Um, he rounded out his law enforcement career with a few years in the Hawaiian Islands as a special agent, part of a real life Hawaii Five O team. Dave's now retired from law enforcement and spends time growing um, California avocados and riding with his wife, Mary, and there are three dogs. Do we still have three dogs? Four dogs. Yeah, that's what I thought. And she's trying but, to get me to take another one right now. Well, you have a big piece of property, Dave. You can, right. you know, you can manage four dogs. Well, well, welcome. Welcome back. Thank you for having me. Uh, you know, we were talking a little bit off camera about uh, you being one of the most prolific writers and readers that I know. Uh, you're the only guy I know who could read 150 books and write three books at a time in the same um, time frame. So, uh, but let, let's talk about your most recent um, book. Well, one of your most recent books, the one that, the title that I just love. You, you, you say that, because I don't want to take away your glory. If there, it's, a, it's called A Fearsome Moonlight Black. Um, tell, us, tell us a little bit about it. Uh, oh. um, well, I had, I, when I first started law enforcement, I had a pretty wild first year. And I wanted to write a memoir on it. And I tried to write a memoir three different times, but it's a different kind of structure. Um, I'm a thriller structure or a mystery structure, and um, I couldn't get it to work. So I, I, the fourth time I tried, I just added a um, story arc, a fictional story arc, and then I laid in the uh, real life stories. So the first half is absolutely true, except for the last scene in the first half of the book, which I, is the start of the fictionalization. In the second half, I layered in some real life um, incidents, but it's the mostly fiction of the second half. So the, the um, synopsis is um, Dave Beckett. I just keep thinking of you know who Beckett, my favorite castle character. Uh, but um, he starts out uh, in a different place than he ends up, probably. Uh, what were some of the most shocking things that you saw as? When thinking back as a young cop that that formed your or changed your way of looking at things? Um, the, the, the first the first time I was a cadet, <clears throat> I was riding with uh, my first night on a ride along. Um, we we ran into an, it's a longer story. I don't want to take up all the time, but I got into a fight um, with this other with the patrol officer. I was 19, I think I wasn't carrying a gun or any weapons. And we pulled over a car that had just stabbed and uh, Critically wounded somebody, and the people in the car didn't uh, con consent or, or comply, and we had to we ended up fighting them, um, and that was an eye opener for me. That was the very first eye opener I had, and then later on I went to a suicide uh, by myself, and it was my first suicide, and it was extremely gory, um, and then a murder uh, of a woman, and it was brutal, um, and then a fatal car accident, all of, all in the first year plus. There was another shooting, another murder. I, you know, I, I keep thinking about, oh, and then there's an officer involved shooting, my first officer involved shooting that year. And I put, I wrapped them all up into a package and I put them in a fearsome moonlight black. So, you know, when you hear those things and you think about the impact that they have on the actual human being, you're such a nice guy, Dave. You know, <laughs> you have, you have um, a sense of humor and, uh, an understanding and compassion for people, um, despite, I mean, I think you could say, despite seeing people on the worst days of their lives, um, is that something you always had, or is that something you develop over time as a, to keep you human or a defense mechanism, or how, how does that stay there? Well, uh, you know, it's, I, <laughs> I, I actually got into it because I, I love the adventure of it, um, and I wasn't, uh, it, we have nothing but negative contacts usually 
a majority of cop contacts are negative contacts. So you have to just take that as, as, as for what it is and, and deal with it. And I always talk to people just like I'm talking to you until they decide to change up the uh, narrative. And then I, I move to put their, what, to their level. So yeah, um, I had a good time doing it. I, I would still be doing it if I was still young enough and strong enough to do it. I, I love my job. I still dream about it. And does it keep you up? Because I think it would keep me awake if I was dreaming about that. Well, Mary says sometimes my legs are, are running. Yeah. Like <laughs> I believe it. <laughs> I'm always ch- I was always chasing crooks. <laughs> so when, when you were writing this book and you were thinking back on the events that you were writing about, uh, how, did they, how did they filter through? I mean, what, what kind of experience was it when you actually sit, sat down and relived those events to, to write them for somebody well, else? Um, people like, like to hear the cop story. So I, I was telling those stories for years. Well, I, I, I retired with 31 years on, and by the time I wrote the book, another 10 years had passed. So 40 years had gone by of me telling those stories. So it wasn't that difficult to, um, to convert it from an oral, uh, uh, history to a written history. Um, and it did bring back, uh, memories because as soon as I started writing it, I started remembering more of the incident, you know, because when you, when I was writing it, I had to add more details to make it work, and it brought the, the stories more starkly uh, into my memory. So, when you're writing a book like that, at the same time as writing other books, how how do you switch gears and voices, and especially when you're writing something something so close uh, as well? Um, well. <laughs> I'm on book number 65 right now, I think, that I've written. Okay, Dave, I used to like you. We're done. <laughs> I was on 38. I sold, I wrote, I've written 38 books before I sold my first one. And since then, I write two and a half books. Now I'm writing three books a year. So I, I think I'm in, my, I'm in the 60s right now. Um, but because of that, I have a set pattern. I have a, a process. I, I decide what my three plot lines are going to be. I take a couple of notes on it. And then I start scene sequencing from each pot, plot line and then use a transition uh, over to those other plot lines. Um, the, um, yeah, and, and that's, what that, that's, that's the way it works best for me. Then when I start, I go back 20 pages before I start writing because I want the cadence, the timing, the voice, and most, most important, to be the same when I start. Because you could sit down and start writing, just start writing the book, and you could be slightly elated, slightly depressed, um, slightly sad, uh, and you don't want that to come out in the tone of your book. So I go back 20 pages, I edit forward, and then I write four pages, you know, four, four to six pages. So with that process, I, I would do uh, one book in the morning and maybe one book in the afternoon and one book at night on, on when I was doing three books. Um, but lately it's just been two, and I do. Um, that in the morning and that process at night. Sounds like you're slacking, Dave. Two books. <laughs> uh, so when when you write that, um, so how many hours a day are you writing? Well, I'll sit down and write probably five hours in the morning, four to five hours. Um, are you still getting up at the crack of dawn? Or? That that comes and goes. Uh, if I wake up at three o'clock in the morning and it has been happening lately, I just get up for the day. And I get I get a lot of good solid writing in then, um, because the the house has a bunch of different problems, you know, leaking and water heater and dogs and so you know early in the morning is best, uh, but yeah then then at night uh, I usually wait till uh, Mary goes to bed uh, and then I start writing again. Um, so let so you 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 have a um, um, I love this title. Here's some Moonlight Black. That's out, recently out, right? right Available. Right. And then yeah. you, you talked about um, all, some of the other books that you've written, and then you have my favorite Bruno Johnson series. So how, right. what, how many books are in that series? Uh, Bruno Johnson, uh, the 10th one just came out, is called The Scorned. Um, and it's a, it's a great book. It's uh, very tight. Um, there's a lot of, there's three different plot lines that are, are, that are happening at the same time. Um, it's set in Southern California. The next Bruno book is uh, The Diabolical. We're in post-production on that one. It comes out in fe- now February. And that one's set entirely in Costa Rica, which I had a lot of fun setting it in Costa Rica, a lot of research, more than I normally do. 
Um, the Fearsome Moonlight Black is a trilogy. Uh, the first one, the second one is called um, A Lonesome Blood Red Sun, which is done and in post-production. And the third one is called A Gray Cadaverous Dawn. Uh, and I'm halfway done with that one. But I had, I was gonna just shoot that one all the way through because I had it all in my mind what was gonna happen. But what, but what happens with me is I get an idea and it's, it's like a, a toy. I, I wanna go play with that idea. So I start, I'm writing two other books right now. And um, the one I'm writing now is a different point of view. It's a mystery structure. It's an 82 year old man who wakes up and there's a red head um, in his house who looks like uh, uh, Gilda from a movie, Rita Hayworth. Mm -hmm. Looks like Rita Hayworth. And she, she contends that she is his second wife and he just forgot. And that's how the book starts. Oh my God. <laughs> you, you know, it's funny. I think you are the type of author that if somebody reads your books and wants to invest in a world and a character and just likes to live there, your books are fantastic for that. You know, because it, you do, um, you are prolific and you do such a great job with setting and details and there's an emotional um, aspect to the book, but there's also, um, it's not so dark all the time. Um, Thank you. Yeah, there's I, a lot I, of humanity. I try to, I, I try to put the humanity in and the humor. And in um, the scorned, I added a dog because everybody likes a dog and the dog doesn't like Bruno, but he's comic relief for because this book was is a little more gritty than the other books. And so then I carried that dog over into Diabolical, which basically the dog kind of follows Bruno to Costa Rica. Would you say uh, a fearsome uh, Moonlight Black is less gritty or more gritty than the Bruno Johnson series for people who are trying to decide who they uh, well, like it's, to it's they probably, both? Yeah, okay. It's probably more gritty because there's, there's not as much humor in it. It's written too. It's written too close to the bone. I mean, it's 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 right. I wrote it just the way it happened. Those scenes in the first part of that book, it, it, you know, I, I was talking to you before about my mom coming to that fatal car accident and you know yelling at me uh, from the from the curb. I, I wrote all that just the way it happened. The officer involved shooting. Um, I wrote that just the way that happened. Um, well, that you know, the whole your whole career is so amazing. And one thing I. I think people don't uh, always think about is the, the toll that it takes on the person. So it's one thing to be doing the job and then to stop doing the job. Uh, when you live your life like that on an adrenaline fueled rocket ride, and then all of a sudden you aren't living your life like that. How was that uh, transition for you and did writing help? Yeah, writing, writing definitely helps because it keeps my mind and my hands busy because otherwise I'd, I would probably just sit around the couch depressed because I can't be like a dog. I can't chase the ball anymore. Um, so how many, did we say how many hours a day you write? Um, usually the first session is four to five hours. And then the second session is only two to three. So you, you are an inspiration to all of us, Dave. Oh. Uh, so, and we have a minute and um, I just, I love that the other series that you're working on. I'm so intrigued. I, I just can't wait for that. The Imogene. Oh, the blind devotion of Imogene. Yeah. I mean, can uh, you just touch on that? Where Dave's selling that if anybody's listening. So go ahead. Any publisher. It's out to two publishers right now. And I think one of them's pretty, pretty serious about taking it. Um, it's, it's a book about a, a 60, 73 year old woman who just gets out of prison on parole for murder. And, um, she she killed her husband, but she didn't really in her mind. Uh, she in her mind she's innocent, and she went to prison for ten years, and she's angry about it. And um, when she was in prison, she she couldn't believe she was there, and she and the, her cellmate said, "You gotta um, get rid of this angst, or you gonna it's gonna eat you up." So she decided to blame the president of the United States, and she started sending threatening letters to the president, and that goes on for ten years, three sitting presidents. And when she gets out, she writes a novel. Well, she starts writing again in prison and it's called Peekaboo Potus. And um, that's one of the plot lines. And the other plot line is when she's, the old book opens and she's working in a store called Dentco. It's where all these uh, grocery stores uh, have these dented uh, cans and stuff. 
And this is all based, this, the, what I'm telling you now is all based on true stuff. Um, there was a massage parlor right next to this Dentco and a friend of mine worked at the, and his family owned the Dentco. So I was always there and I got to see the type of clientele at the, at the massage parlor. Um, and so that, that, that plays very heavily. So this, this uh, mafia guy walks into Dentco and tells Imogene that you'll give me $200 a, a week or I'm going to burn your place down. So she's on parole and she can't be associating with any, even anywhere near this mafia guy. Um, and she has uh, the, the peekaboo POTUS thing going. She sent it to a publisher and the publisher liked it so much that he's after her to, to, to do the book. And she doesn't know if she wants to do the book because it's so uh, it's such a tell-all kind of thing. Um, and then the, the other plot is um, this the neighbor, his father passes away and Imogene goes over to help her clean out the garage and they find a crate with a dead woman in it. And this, that, that happened in Yucca Valley where I was working. And so I just added that plot line in. So that's a plot line, the Peekaboo Potus is a plot line and the Mafia guy is a plot line. And Imogene, who is a cigarette smoking, uh, slits beer drinking uh, older woman has to deal with all of this. And it's my grandmother, I wrote my grandmother into this. She, Imogene is my grandmother with her saying her sage comments. I mean, I, it's exactly the thing that she did. And that's why it's so much fun writing. And I mean, I, I ripped through this thing because it was so true to life for me. Ever hear her whispering in your ear? Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> and she had a unique view on life because all she did was sit on the couch and smoke two packs of Marlboros a day and drink slits malt liquor. She was a character. Uh, I, can't, I can't wait for that. Where can people find your books, Dave? Uh, anywhere in any bookstores, um, any independent bookstore, Barnes and Noble, Amazon. Uh, you can uh, e email me at uh, davidputnambooks.com. I'm happy to email and talk to anybody about writing, about the books, about anything about the, in, involving that stuff. Okay, well, thank you so much for being here this morning. It's always great to see you um, and, and hear your stories. And we wish you the best of luck on all of your books. Um, you. And can't wait till uh, Imogene comes out. Thank you for having me. All right. Okay. Take care. Thank you, Dave. And thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, if you enjoyed today's discussion, but let's be honest, why wouldn't you? Um, if you enjoyed today's discussion, you can share this on Facebook, or you can wait till it comes out on our SCWA Writers Online YouTube channel, where you can find our interview with Dave Putnam, as well as a hundred more. So, uh, yay, celebration. <laughs> Um, so and until next week, please um, take care and keep reading. Okay.